I presume we've gotten to one now. So I will call this meeting to order. The Committee on the Judiciary, Subcommittee on the Civil Rights and the Constitution comes to order without objection. The chair is authorized to call a recess at any time that he so desires or in a recess. I welcome everyone to today's hearing on examining civil rights litigation part two, state and local government employer liability. Email address, distribute exhibits or whatever that's we've got provided that for members. If you'd like to submit those, the email address is there and you know all about that. Uh, all members and witnesses, all those in person, et cetera, turn your microphones off or you have feedback and problems. Unmute yourself when you seek recognition. And now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today's hearing is the second in a series of hearings before the subcommittee examining civil rights litigation reform and follows up on our first hearing on qualified immunity. At our previous hearing, members and witnesses expressed potential support for imposing respondeat superior or vicarious liability on municipal employers in cases filed under 42 U.S.C. 1983. The statute that creates a right of action against state and local officials and local governments for violations of constitutional or other federal rights. For instance, Judge John O. Newman of the Second Circuit testified this could be a better means than individual officer liability, police officer, for ensuring that victims of constitutional or civil rights violations be compensated. Our hearing today will examine that idea in more detail. Responding at Superior is routinely applied common law doctrine under which employers may be held liable for their employees' torts committed while acting within the scope of their employment. Over 40 years ago, in Monell versus Department of Social Services of the City of New York, an employment discrimination case brought by pregnant municipal employees against the City of New York, the Supreme Court held that under Section 1983, local governing bodies could be held directly liable for monetary, declaratory, and injunctive relief in cases alleging that their employees committed a constitutional violation against a third party. In reaching its holding in Monell, however, the Supreme Court articulated the view that while Congress had intended to include municipalities under the statute's ambit, it had specifically excluded claims based on respondeat superior theory. Instead, Monell held that local government employers are liable for their employers, employees' deprivation of a constitutional right under 1983 when the employee's alleged deprivation implements or executes a policy, ordinance, regulation, decision, or custom adopted by that body's officers. Under Supreme Court decisions applying Monell and its legal progeny, local governments have been subject to such direct liability, but only under narrow and difficult to prove circumstances. Moreover, the case in this area has become case law increasingly confusing for both plaintiffs and defendants. As Justice Breyer has observed, the Supreme Court's basic efforts to distinguish between vicarious liability and liability derived from the policy or custom has produced a body of law that is neither re readily understandable nor easy to apply. When it comes to state liability for my not monetary relief under Section 1983, the story is even simpler. They are immune from such suits in the court's view. Congress did not clearly abrogate state sovereign immunity in the language of Section 1983. Therefore, according to the court, the 11th Amendment, which prohibits federal courts from hearing certain kinds of lawsuits against states, bars such lawsuits. For those of you who are lawyers, you may be wondering about the possibility of bringing a Section 1983 claim in state court where the 11th Amendment does not apply. But there, too, the Supreme Court has foreclosed suits for monetary relief, holding that Congress excluded states from statute's definition of a person. It may sound from my description of the current state of the law as though I'm blaming the Supreme Court for limiting the ability of victims of constitutional deprivations to seek redress in federal courts, but the truth is the court is not solely responsible. Of course, decisions over the years have effectively foreclosed or narrowed the ability of victims to hold state and local governments accountable for their employees' constitutional violations under 1983, and it must be acknowledged those decisions rest on the court's interpretation of the statute rather than on its view of Congress's constitutional authority to legislate in this area. Like Monell, many of the court's decisions that concern local and state employer liability are not recent. In other words, Congress has long possessed the power to address the limitations on 1983 litigation created by the court, but for decades it has failed to act. Congress, in my view, has lacked the political will to do the right thing on Section 1983. Public's most recent demands for racial justice and police accountability, however, have shown a spotlight on these longstanding issues related to local and state employer liability under 1983 and brought renewed urgency for Congress to act. For example, I've introduced H.R. 1489, the Civil Rights Enhancement and Law Enforcement Accountability Improvement Act, which would amend Section 1983 to impose vicarious liability on a municipality for a constitutional violation committed by one of its law enforcement officers. This both gives more likelihood that the plaintiff will get uh, uh, financial uh, remuneration for their loss and that the officer will not be in, in, impeded in his uh, uh, efforts to patrol the streets properly for fear of monetary uh, 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 
lawsuit of court himself because his employer would be responsible for that um, possible tort. I recognize, however, the agents of state and local governments can commit all kinds of constitutional violations outside the policing context, including infringements on the First Amendment and religious freedom rights, for example, and I'm open to taking a broader approach to this legislation. Note last Congress, Senator Mike Braun of Indiana, a Republican, introduced legislation in part also imposed by Kyrgyz liability under municipalities under 1983. I acknowledge differences among our subcommittee members on issues surrounding the civil rights litigation reform. It's also heartening to see at our last meeting, perhaps there appeared to be some level of agreement around issues related to municipal liability under Section 1983, particularly Mr. McClintock's response. It's my hope that at today's hearing we'll continue to build on this potential consensus and can work together to develop concrete legislative responses that enjoy broad support. I thank the witnesses for appearing today and I look forward to their testimony and I recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from the state of Louisiana, where they not only have uh, uh, jambalaya, but they have uh, oil. Uh, Mr. Johnson for his opening statement. <laughs> An exceptional culture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here this morning and appearing by video, those who are not here in person. As noted, today's gathering is the committee's second hearing regarding civil rights litigation reform. Today, we will focus on state and local government liability for the actions of their employees. I personally spent nearly two decades in federal courts litigating these cases before I got to Congress. Uh, routinely litigated cases under Section 1983 of the Civil Rights Act for the violation of persons' uh, religious freedom and free speech rights. So this issue is of great interest to me. Uh, currently under Section 1983, of course, people can sue the government when one of its employees violates their constitutional rights. However, under Section 1983 litigation, uh, it, it's subject to certain restraints, such as sovereign immunity, qualified immunity, and the Monell Doctrine. As noted, the Monell Doctrine permits injured parties to sue local governments for monetary, declaratory, or injunctive relief under Section 1983 only if, quote, the action that is alleged to be unconstitutional implements or executes a policy, statement, ordinance, regulation, or decision officially adopted and promulgated by the body's officers, unquote. Thus, the Monell Doctrine does not provide complete liability protection for local governments if their employees engage in certain misconduct. We most often discuss the Monell Doctrine as it relates to police misconduct, and I think that's where the focus is. Over the past couple of years, some scholars have advocated for certain police reform proposals, such as getting rid of qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. Additionally, some have argued for the eradication of the Monell Doctrine, thereby making local governments and municipalities vicariously liable for actions or omissions of their employees when the employee is acting within the scope of his or her employment. However, as the committee examines the Monell Doctrine today, I hope that we can have a rational conversation about the potential ramifications of removing this doctrine. For example, we need to seriously consider how moving to a vicarious liability standard may financially impact smaller localities and municipalities. We also need to consider what impact such reform might have on officer behavior. We ought to be very clear, we should be. There's no room in our society for truly bad actors that engage in misconduct while on the job. But conversations surrounding police reform really need to be thoughtful and balanced and measured. You have to think about all the unintended consequences that may result. We have many, many brave men and women who put on uniforms every day to serve and protect the great citizens of this country, and they're often charged with making tough, split-second decisions. And they must do this difficult job in an environment now that is increasingly hostile to law enforcement officers. Democrat calls to defund the police a media that increasingly portrays law enforcement in a negative light, and, and radical district attorneys who refuse to prosecute criminals while crime is surging in major U.S. cities, all that make it all the more necessary for us to in, ensure that law enforcement officers are equipped with all the tools they need to do their jobs safely and effectively. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. At this point, we normally recognize our Chair and our ranking member, neither of which are here, and I don't think either have a statement to, to give us. So we will go straight to the witnesses. And we welcome our witnesses, thank them for participating, and I'll introduce each of you before your testimony. Uh, we've got a five-minute rule. Um, there's uh, four minutes, you got a green light. One minute, you got a yellow light. Red light means you're supposed to be finished, and you should be. Uh, there's something on your computer to show you. Uh, for people here, there's a light somewhere. You'll see it, I guess. And for the people on, on, on Zoom, you'll see it on your screen. Uh, should be visible. Uh, you're all under the oath to uh, our duty to tell the truth. If you don't tell the truth, you could be picked up, taken to the ho pokey, and put in jail. So tell the truth. 
Uh, our first witness is Karen Blum, Professor Emerita of Su Suffolk University Law School, taught for almost 50 years in areas of civil procedure, federal courts, civil rights, and police misconduct litigation. Serves faculty member for workshops sponsored by the Federal Judicial Center for ju federal judges and federal magistrate judges, authored numerous articles in Section 1983 area, and is co-author of the treatise Police Misconduct Law and Litigation. As a Professor Emerita, she continues to engage in 1983 programs throughout the country, JD from her, uh, Suffolk University Law and her LLM from Harvard, BA in philosophy from Wells College. You are recognized for five minutes. Ma'am, you're, you're, you're on mute. And there we go. Okay, well, good morning and thank you for uh, having me and giving me this opportunity to testify this morning. Uh, I have taught in this area of Section 1983 for over well over 40 years, close to 50, uh, and uh, primarily in the area of Section 1983 litigation with a focus on police misconduct litigation. One of my earliest law review articles was on the Supreme Court's 1978 Monell decision. I argued then, and I still believe, uh, that the court got it wrong when it rejected vicarious liability under Section 1983. There are four points I would like to make this morning uh, with respect to this topic, and I thank you for the opportunity to do so. First, uh, legislative history does not support the conclusion that Congress rejected vicarious liability for local government entities under Section 1983. Any argument against vicarious liability based on the congressional rejection of the so-called Sherman Amendment in 1871 is misplaced and simply wrong. A reading of the proposed amendment reveals that the proposal would have made local governments strictly liable for private acts of violence committed within their borders. This was not a form of vicarious liability based on conduct of government employees acting under color of state law, employees over whom the government exercises control. Second point, scholars and judges, including Supreme Court justices, have questioned the soundness of Monell's rejection of vicarious liability. In PEMBAR in 1986, Justice Stevens criticized the rejection of respondeat superior liability as in, inconsistent with the legislative history of Section 1983. In Bryan County versus Brown uh, in 1997, Justice Breyer, joined by others, called for a reexamination of the legal soundness of the distinction drawn by the Supreme Court between direct and vicarious liability, suggesting that that aspect of Monell should be revisited, especially in light of the fact that virtually all states have indemnification statutes that come into play when government employees are sued for conduct performed under color of state law. Uh, as chair, uh, as Chair Cohen mentioned, uh, Judge John O. Newman of the Second Circuit has long been an advocate of employer liability in Section 1983 cases. His testimony is included in the record for the hearings conducted on qualified immunity before the subcommittee on March 31st, 2022. And as David Rudofsky, a well-respected scholar and civil rights lawyer has put it, the incorporation of respondeat superior as a basis of relief against the government entity in one elegant move removes all of the difficult and irrelevant issues regarding municipal policy and practice and qualified immunity. Third point, as a practical matter, Monell claims are difficult to plead and prove as well as expensive and time consuming to litigate for both plaintiffs and defendants. The area of municipal or entity liability has become, in the words of Justice Breyer, a highly complex body of interpretive law. Municipal liability claims have become procedurally more difficult for plaintiffs to assert since the court's imposition of a more stringent pleading standard in Twombly and Iqbal, and even more challenging to ultimately prove after the court's 2011 decision in Connick versus Thompson. The bottom line is that litigating Monell claims is burdensome, expensive, and time consuming for plaintiffs, defendants, and the courts. Final point, 
imposing vicarious liability on governmental entities under Section 1983 would not open the floodgates to litigation or liability. The reality is, as Professor Joanna Schwartz has documented, local and state governments currently indemnify their employees when there is a finding of individual liability. Individual defendants rarely, if ever, pay anything out of pocket for judgments rendered uh, against them in these civil rights suits. And last, very important to remember, is the fact that there is no liability on the part of anyone unless the plaintiff carries the burden of making out an underlying constitutional violation. And the standards the court has established for various constitutional violations are rigorous and difficult to meet. Unlike state law claims, gross negligence, simple negligence will never suffice to prevail on a constitutional claim. The end. Thank you. Well, right on the dot, uh, Professor <laughs> Blum, you, you get an A for that. Thank um, you. <laughs> our next witness is Bhavani Ravindran. Did I say that correctly? Uh, she's a partner at Romanucci Blandin LLC in Chicago, where she concentrates her practice on civil rights litigation under the Civil Rights Act and state court cases of act, causes of action against governmental employers. During her tenure working on civil rights litigation, she has represented individuals and families in cases regarding the deprivation of their constitutional rights, severe injury at the hands of state actors, or the loss of loved ones before juries and appellate courts. She has been instrumental in the representation of her clients in their civil suits, including the families of George Floyd, um, Botham John, and Javier Ambler. Ms. Ravindran received her law degree from American University's Washington College of Law and her undergraduate degree in political science from Case Western Reserve University. Ms. Ravindran, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Ranking Member Johnson, Rep Representative Ross, and members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to be here today, and I thank you for your time. Respondeat Superior and Monell are two sides of the same coin, providing necessary avenues for litigants who have experienced a violation of their civil rights. I'm asking the subcommittee to consider legislating to add Respondeat Superior or vicarious liability to this area of litigation while maintaining the Monell Doctrine. Respondent superior attaches when an employee acting within the course and scope of their employment causes harm to another person and the employer is held liable for that conduct. The reasoning is that an employee is acting at the direction of the employer and the employer should share in legal responsibility for harm caused for its benefit. Respondent superior often applies where an employee's use of force is an expected part of their duties or job description, even if unauthorized, such as a bouncer at a bar. Monell v. Department of Social Services held that a governmental employer can be sued directly for unconstitutional policies, practices, or customs that were the moving force behind or caused a constitutional violation under Section 1983. Monell is an invaluable tool for certain Section 1983 claims. For example, where a police department has a long-standing policy that allows for neck restraints on prone subjects, which officers are using to engage in excessive deadly force. Another example, where overwhelming heat in a prison due to building conditions cause unconstitutional harm to inmates. Monell determined that respondent superior did not apply to Section 1983, despite long-standing common law recognizing its application to municipal corporations' employees. Claimants who cannot meet the burdens of Monell do not have a realistic remedy where state law or collective bargaining agreements do not provide for indemnification of governmental actors as most governmental actors do not ensure their own work or have sufficient assets to satisfy judgment. Monell's high standards of proof create a significant burden, including finding information before the lawsuit begins to get past pleading standards, extensive discovery, and success in motion practice being dependent on information in the sole control of the defendants. The numerous obstacles in the path of successfully proving a Monell claim become a deterrent to litigants, attorneys, and the public in holding municipal entities accountable for failing to be proactive in policy, discipline, and training. For these reasons, Monell is not an adequate, adequate substitute for respondent superior. The availability of the application of respondent superior to Section 1983 claims would lessen the number of Monell claims, saving resources for all parties involved. 
Litigants would be able to choose whether vicarious liability or Monell was better suited for the facts of their specific case. For example, in a matter involving a corrections officer who sexually assaults an inmate violating their Eighth Amendment rights, respondeat superior may not apply if it is beyond the scope of employment. However, if the prison had previously overlooked known repeated assaults of inmates and failed to train, discipline, or terminate its employees, Monell would be well suited. On the other hand, the assessment would differ in a scenario where a well-trained officer with prior without prior complaints for excessive force discharges a firearm at an unarmed subject during a traffic stop when the subject discloses there is a legal firearm in the vehicle. If the officer acted in violation of the policies and training of the police department, a Monell claim may not be applicable, but respondent superior would likely apply as it was within the scope of employment. Legislation to include respondeat superior in civil rights claims would have many other benefits. Vicarious liability would apply to all municipal actors, not just police officers, ensuring additional protection for governmental employees that private employees enjoy. It would add an additional layer of protection for officers' privacy. Officers would potentially feel supported by their employers decreasing burnout in smaller jurisdictions where indemnification is not guaranteed. Municipalities would have an added incentive to train officers on policies, root out problematic practices, and terminate problematic officers. Respondent Superior would also reduce a municipality's costs because attorney's fees and costs paid out after a verdict are far more onerous in a Monell claim. And in jurisdictions where officers are not indemnified, there would be protection for officers and an available remedy to litigants, allowing for civil rights claims to be litigated wherever they occur, not just where officers are indemnified. In conclusion, the Judiciary Committee and this honorable subcommittee should consider legislation that would codify respondent superior while preserving Monell to be utilized when the appropriate circumstances arise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Rafael Mangual. He is a senior fellow and head of research for um, policing and public safety initiative at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. He's also a contributing editor for City Journal. He has authored and co-authored a number of Manhattan Institute reports and op-eds on issues ranging from urban crime and jail violence to broader matters of criminal and civil justice reform. In 2020, he was appointed to serve a four-year term as a member of the New York State Advisory Committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He testified before this subcommittee back in March at our hearing on qualified immunity. Mr. Mangual received his JD from DePaul University, where he was president of the Federalist Society and vice president of the appellate moot court team. He received his BA from the City University of New York's Baruch College. Mr. Mangual, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, and I'd like to once again express <clears throat> my gratitude to the subcommittee for extending to me the honor and privilege of delivering testimony as part of its continuing examination of civil rights litigation reform. I was also honored to have addressed this body, <clears throat> excuse me, um, during the first part of its examination back in March of this year, and today as I did then, I will focus my remarks specifically on police litigation. During that last hearing, I offered reasons to be skeptical of the idea that qualified immunity essentially functions as an unpierceable shield against liability for police officers, such that officers internalize a sense of impunity that then leads them to misbehave in ways they wouldn't otherwise if they had more financial skin in the game. To the extent that a proposal to move to a vicarious liability or respondeat superior model reflects similar concerns about the incentive structure undergirding police behavior, I do think it's worth briefly reiterating the three primary reasons why such skepticism is warranted. First, there exists in use of force situations a documented tendency on the part of officers to default to what researchers call an intuitive as opposed to analytical approach to decision making, mostly because the situations in which such decisions are generally made don't lend themselves to the type of analysis that would be required for an officer to accurately assess his or her risk of personal liability and constitutional tort. Second, empirical research and other available data show that qualified immunity functions at the bar to recovery in a very small share of cases, likely less than 4%, that are filed against police officers. And third, as things stand now, as was already mentioned, nearly 100% of the dollars recovered against police defendants in civil rights lawsuits, approximately 99.98 to one, according to one study, um, are already paid by the taxpayers in their respective jurisdictions pursuant to indemnification practices rooted in either statutory requirements or contractual obligations. And yet, despite this reality, a recent study found with respect to use of force issues 
quote, unequivocal proof that officers are not notified of the facts and holdings of cases that clearly establish law for qualified immunity purposes. The question then is whether, and if so, to what degree and by what mechanisms would shifting to a respondeat superior model in civil rights cases significantly change police behavior in the aggregate? Seems to me that the answer to that question is far from clear. If, however, the primary concern animating proposals to shift liability for civil rights violations from state and uh, to state and local government um, bodies themselves is to minimize the risk that plaintiffs whose rights have been violated will go without redress, then this sort of end run around qualified immunity makes a bit more sense. That said, there are issues worthy of consideration, among them the risk of, the risk of destabilizing insurance markets in ways that will leave smaller municipalities unable to afford to insure themselves against the risk of excess liability. This is more than just a theoretical concern. In the 1980s, the municipal liability insurance market experienced significant destabilization, leading some municipalities to completely disband their police departments. And there is already evidence documented by the University of Virginia's Professor Kenneth Abraham of more recent insurance market destabilization related to police litigation that really ought to place this, place this risk among the primary considerations of this body as it considers related proposals. A more moderate approach might be to, as I proposed during my testimony in March, to legislatively reestablish the analytical sequence set out in Saucier versus Katz and restrict municipal liability only to those cases in which a not yet established constitutional or other federal civil right is found to have been violated. This would provide several benefits, including the promotion of the development of the law, more quickly shrinking the scope of unestablished rights, maintaining important if limited protections enjoyed by individual officers, minimizing budgetary risks of a broader vicarious liability approach, and ensuring that plaintiffs whose rights have been violated are able to recover. To minimize the risk of destabilizing insurance markets and leaving smaller municipalities unable to afford their own insurance policies in the lurch, an expansion of municipal liability should be coupled with an effort to optimize the regulatory environment with an eye toward allowing private insurers to operate across state lines in order to build larger risk pools, as well as facilitating the creation and expansion of intergovernmental risk pools. Any legislation on this front should also build in a significant grace period between passage and the effective date of the legislation to allow for the development of the infrastructure municipalities are going to need to have in place in order to effectively manage their risk. Finally, I'd like to also take this opportunity to suggest that perhaps another thing this subcommittee should consider is whether the oppositional tone of our public debate and Congress's role in contributing to that tone has contributed to the current police recruitment and retention crisis that risks leading to a situation in which individuals are dissuaded from careers in policing, leaving departments to choose between and among lower quality candidates who may actually be more likely to engage in official misconduct due to either malice or ignorance. An example of this is the well-documented phenomenon of wandering cops, officers who leave one department under a disciplinary cloud and are then hired by another. A recent report by my Manhattan Institute colleague, Dorothy Moses Schultz, suggests that the recruitment of high quality officers will play a key role in addressing this phenomenon and the problems that stem from it and recommends a federal effort to subsidize the improvement of the quality of our nation's police forces through hiring. With that, I wanna once again, thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak to these important issues of which I hope this statement will contribute to a better understanding. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our final witness is Pavond Adut. Um, please tell me if I've mispronounced your name. She is an associate professor of law at the University of Virginia School of Law. Her research centers on the modern uses of judicial power through the lens of the federal courts. Focusing on the structures that compose the institutions that are most often before the federal courts, her work incorporates multiple legal disciplines, including constitutional law, civil procedure, and criminal law and procedure. Her current projects study the phenomenon of litigating federal power disputes as well as judicial agenda setting outside of the federal courts. Professor Adut reserve, reserve, received her law degree from Columbia Law School where she was the James Kent Scholar and recipient of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Prize. She received her undergraduate degree in economics and government with highest distinction from the University of Virginia. After graduating from law school, she served as a law clerk for the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, and the Honorable Deborah Ann Livingston of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Professor Adut, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you uh, for having me today to talk about this critical issue. Today, I want to focus on Congress's authority here and the power that you have to make real change. 
uh, in the realm of sovereign immunity. Sovereign immunity is the legal principle that sovereign entities cannot be hauled into court without their consent. Sovereign immunity is an immunity from suit, not an immunity from liability. And this means that sovereigns generally can set the terms for how, to what extent, and in which courts they'll face legal liabilities. Although state sovereign immunity is grounded in the 11th Amendment, it's different in important respects from federal sovereign immunity. Importantly, state sovereign immunity is not absolute, and its contours are not entirely within a state's own hands. Congress has the main role in defining its boundaries. Under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, Congress has the power to authorize federal courts to enter damages awards against states as a means of enforcing the substantive guarantees of the 14th Amendment. In an opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist, the Supreme Court recognized that the 14th Amendment shifted the federal state balance that has been carried forward to this day. Not only does Section 5 of the 14th Amendment contain an express grant of plenary legislative authority, but it does so in the context of an amendment whose other sections by their own terms embody limitations on state authority. For this reason, Congress may choose to abrogate sovereign, state sovereign immunity to enforce the substantive guarantees of the 14th Amendment. To successfully do so, a statute must satisfy a two-pronged test. First, the statute must evince a clear congressional intent to abrogate state sovereign immunity in the text of the statute. For example, you could provide a, a right of action for monetary damages against a state. Second, in order to have requisite constitutional authority, the statutory provision must be congruent and proportional to the targeted violation. Although the test is not well-defined, we do know that Congress may enact prophylactic legislation that prescribes facially constitutional conduct in order to prevent and deter unconstitutional conduct. We also know that courts look to and depend upon evidentiary findings that Congress makes in prescribing unconstitutional conduct. It's important for Congress to document, for example, whether there's a history or pattern of unconstitutional conduct or discrimination. It's important to note that Congress has the latitude to abrogate state sovereign immunity only to remedy rights that are protected by the 14th Amendment. This means that Congress has broader latitude to abrogate state sovereign immunity in the context of race-based or gender-based discrimination, for example, than for age-based discrimination. There's an interesting federal state balance in recognizing that Section 5 of the 14th Amendment provides authority for abrogation of immunity. Ordinarily, states are treated as co-equal sovereigns whose monetary fisks are protected. But when states engage in systemic subversion of federal rights, the Constitution provides mechanisms for federal supremacy, one form of which is congressional authority to provide a cause of action for monetary damages. I want to now clarify why it is that Section 1983 does not by its terms apply to states or, or act as an abrogation of state sovereign immunity. As of now, states may not be sued under 1983 for two independent statutory reasons. First, in a case called Kern versus Jordan, the Supreme Court held that Congress did not clearly manifest an intention to abrogate state sovereign immunity in 1983. The court cited the limited debate on the point of state sovereign immunity as evidence that Congress didn't intend to abrogate immunity in this context. Second, the Supreme Court has held that states are not considered persons within 1983 statutory text. In Will v. Michigan Department of State Police, the Supreme Court reasoned that Congress ordinarily does not use the word person to apply to states. What's more, in statutory interpretation, there's a default rule that Congress must use unmistakably clear language in the statute where it intends to alter the usual constitutional balance between the states and federal government. Together, these two decisions show that it is in Congress's hands to determine whether to provide a monetary damages remedy against the states, and there is no constitutional barrier to providing such a remedy. I recommend that you be as specific as possible in any legislation seeking to abrogate state sovereign immunity, both in your intent to abrogate immunity and in your reasons for doing so. Be clear in the text of the statute that you're providing a statutory cause of action for monetary damages against the states. And I recommend that you make necessary evidentiary findings of states aversion of federal rights to fortify your statute during judicial review. Although 1983 includes a damages remedy for both constitutional and statutory violations of federal law, it's important to note that your authority to abrogate state sovereign immunity is broader with respect to federal constitutional violations than federal statutory violations because it's aimed at getting at systemic subversion of federal rights uh, by states. Thank you for your time and thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of our learned panelists. Um, we'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. 
Um, just like the ranking member, I too spent um, many years as a civil rights attorney litigating um, under 1983 on a variety of different rights. And I'm very happy that this hearing is extending beyond issues that deal with law enforcement. Um, because as the ranking member said, there are many, many violations of people's civil rights and constitutional rights um, that go well beyond law enforcement. And any action that we take should deal with the broad um, constitutional rights that we all enjoy. And as we know, our Constitution and its amendments exist to guarantee fundamental rights. And when those rights are violated by the government, citizens and residents should be able to expect remedies to repair harm they've experienced and receive assurances that the violations they've experienced will not be repeated. Yet under current law, people who have their rights violated by an employee of the state or municipal government have extremely limited paths to obtain remedies. While Monell holds that a local government can be held responsible for providing relief in cases um, when their employees violate a person's constitutional rights, the court's subsequent interpretation of this case in 1983 make it extremely difficult for plaintiffs to obtain remedies. Monell fur further prevents local governments from being held vicariously liable for rights violations by their employees even though it is common practice for private employers to be vicariously liable for their employees' behavior. While discussion of government liability for police misconduct is particularly pertinent, there are many cases, as I said, of constitutional rights violations by other types of government actors. Free speech, inappropriate social services, terminations of parental rights, illegal searches and seizures. And victims of these violations deserve a path to obtain justice and repair the harm done to them by their own government. Creating accountability for government employers incentivizes them to put in place safety me measures, exert care in hiring, and improve training of employees, acting as a preventative measure against rights violations. Any long-term solutions must consider how we can properly hold state and municipal, go municipal governments accountable for violations that occur under their watch. Um, my first question is for Ms. Ravidran. Can you tell us about all the procedures and steps that are required to proceed with a Monell claim and how it's particularly complex litigation and even hard to get a lawyer to take your case? Thank you for your question, Representative Ross. You, you hit it on the head. It is very complex at every stage. At the very outset, finding an attorney can be difficult because it takes a firm that has the resources to get multiple experts, have the attorneys available to review documents, take depositions um, beyond the normal federal limit of depositions. At the very outset of the case, you need to get information that's within the hands of the defendants, which means that you are FOIAing, um, you know, sending FOIA requests out to municipalities and officers and trying to get as much information as you can. Um, a lot of that information isn't available without confidentiality orders or protective orders of some kind. It's highly redacted, so it's very difficult to build the claim at the outset. We talked a bit about discovery process. Now that's thousands and thousands of pages potentially to prove that there's a pattern in practice that you'd have to go through. So you just really need the numbers in terms of your attorney team. And at the very end of the case, you have to choose uh, you'd have to prove that the violation was caused by this policy, the moving force behind the policy. That is a very difficult burden to prove for plaintiffs unless the acts have been incredibly egregious and well known. And a lot of that information has to come from deposition testimony that is, again, in the, within the control of the municipalities. So it's very difficult, and that's not even to mention trial and having a jury try to understand this very complicated concept. Um, thank you very much. And can you tell us whether in these cases um, generally there's any monetary compensation that comes out or um, is injunctive relief um, more common? For Monell cases, usually mo uh, you're looking for injunctive relief, you're looking for policy change, and having a Monell claim with a 1983 claim sometimes assists in targeting that. Um, when you look for the monetary relief, it's a lot more uh, 
closer to the injury. So you're proving the injury, and then on top of that, you have to prove the constitutional violation. So it makes it easier to get injunctive relief. Thank you very much. Um, I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, a really sharp uh, panel of witnesses. We're grateful for you guys being here. As we've noted, the topic of removing the Manel Doctrine has most recently come up during conversations surrounding the conduct of law enforcement officers and police reform. Some people suggest that uh, the Manel Doctrine provides nearly complete liability protection for state and local governments that employ bad actors. Others are concerned that eliminating the Manel Doctrine would put a major strain on the budgets of small towns and municipalities and would yield a minimal real-world impact. Let me ask my question to Mr. Mangual. Uh, since the summer of 2020, of course, there have been several legislative proposals that would eliminate the Manel Doctrine entirely. Uh, you, you've touched on this, but let me just ask you directly. Do you agree with the premise that police officers are somehow misbehaving because they don't have any financial skin in the game and, and that eradicating the Monell Doctrine would create a noticeable impact on how police act? Uh, I do not agree with that, that characterization of the situation on the ground. I mean, as I've mentioned, if you look at uh, a 1983 litigation filed against individual officers, uh, those cases are very, very often successful. Um, qualified immunity functions as an effective bar in less than 4% of cases. I mean, just look at my city uh, of New York. Uh, there's a, a database of lawsuits filed against the NYPD in federal court maintained by the Legal Aid Society that, that contains about 2,400 cases. If you filter out those cases by disposition, only 74 were disposed of in favor of the police defendants, which is still about 3%. So. Um, the idea that um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, civil rights litigation protections that are, are providing a real financial shield to police officers is wrong, especially because even when officers are successfully, successfully sued in their individual capacities, the municipalities are already picking up the tab. But the, the biggest reason to be skeptical of this, as I mentioned in the front part of my testimony, is that when officers are out in the field, they are making decisions in very rapidly unfolding situations that don't lend themselves to legal analysis. The idea that police officers are faced with a, a criminal suspect and then are engaging in the sort of analysis to, to identify what their potential legal exposure might be um, is just incongruous with the reality of those situations in which officers are acting based on intuition and training. Thanks for that. Um, you, you also talked a little bit about the unintended consequences of eliminating Manel would have on small localities' budgets, and you talked about this destabilizing of the insurance markets. And you, I think you said that it's led to some small towns uh, already completely disbanding their police departments, which is just shocking. Um, and then we've got this recruitment crisis in law enforcement as well. Would you, would you comment a little bit more about how, what a profound effect this would have uh, in this arena? Sure. Sure. So th there's some scholarship um, that I that I cite in my written testimony um, done by Professor John Rappaport that um, explains how in the 1980s, small municipalities, because of the stabilization in the insurance market, did in fact completely disband their police departments. More recent research by Kenneth Abraham shows that a lot of those patterns of destabilization are starting to appear um, again over the last few years. Part of that has to do with the way insurance markets are actually reading the tone of our national debate about policing and police reform and the, the attention that this issue is getting. At the same time, there's been a big proliferation in the availability of cell phone cameras, et cetera, which not only provides different kinds of evidence that may be weighed differently by a jury, but also that places a lot of new political pressures um, on municipalities not to fight cases too hard, which means that the legal exposure might grow. As that happens, most cities, big cities and, and states are able to self-insure against this kind of expenditure, but smaller towns um, don't necessarily have that infrastructure in place. So a shift to complete um, municipal liability in all of these cases uh, might actually present some real problems for smaller municipalities who, who won't be able to afford the kind of insurance that's already contracting in terms of its, the scope of its coverage and increasing in terms of its cost. Thank you for that. I mean, speaking of political pressure, I, I, I think that we have to remember that calls to curtail or abolish qualified immunity and the Monell Doctrine, they have to be considered in the context of today. And that's, you know, that many of our Democrat colleagues have a years long effort to take funding and resources away from police departments. And these calls have even come from some members uh, of this subcommittee. So many large jurisdictions around the country, like Seattle, have defunded their police departments. And in 2020, the city cut its police budget by 17%. What are the effects? Just last week, Seattle Times reported the department is no longer investigating new sexual assault cases because the unit in charge of those matters is so depleted. These are real world effects. 
Uh, and I think this should cause everybody concern. So um, I'm grateful for the thoughtful discussion. There's a lot of um, thoughtful debate that needs to be had about all this. I'm out of time, so I yield back. Um, so next we're gonna recognize Chairman Johnson. Um, I don't see Mr. Raskin on the screen. So Chairman Johnson, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, I'm, I might uh, state that we need to move beyond simply having a conversation about police misconduct and instead put forth some concrete standards of accountability to ensure that local, state, and federal agencies can finally be held accountable under the law for constitutional violations. If you have a constitutional right that is violated with impunity and there's no, no accountability uh, for the violation, uh, then that constitutional right uh, is worthless. And so that's what this discussion is about today. We must fight back um, when the consequences, uh, we must fight back where the consequences can be felt the most, and that is the pockets of those responsible. And so Ms. Uh, Ravindran, uh, the, the law currently acts as a deterrent uh, to quality suits that could bring about accountability by those who've had their civil rights violated by police officers, rather than as a deterrent to the officers and municipalities from engaging in this type of activity and making improvements to reduce claims. Is that correct? Thank you for your question, and, and yes, it is correct. In fact, isn't it true that local police departments are best suited to address deficiencies in training and supervision that often lead to police misconduct rather than the individual officer? Yes, they would be better um, dealt with by the municipality or the police department itself. And current law actually makes police departments less responsible for their officers' actions than, for example, a big chain store would be for the conduct of its security guards. Isn't that correct? Exactly, yes. And Ms. Ravindran, wouldn't it then follow that imposing vicarious liability on municipalities could inform better training policies, procedures, and improve practices within government? Yes, thank you for your question. And can you briefly explain to us why it is important to hold state and local governments accountable through uh, respondent superior? Absolutely. And first of all, it would just equalize what we provide private employer employees in the United States. Public employees who have the same job responsibilities are not provided that same coverage. Um, in addition, it would help municipalities and police departments have added incentive for training programs, changes to policies, and not just what we have under Monell, which is where municipalities are putting forward constitutional policies and failing to train the officers on the application of those policies. So I believe that would be very beneficial. It would ha also help municipalities have added incentive to terminate officers who have repeatedly violated constitutional rights or had com repeated complaints where constitutional violations are a concern. We also uh, would be able to apply respondent superior to protect all governmental employees, not just police officers, and I think that's a very important point. So all of those opportunities would be available for our municipalities and police departments to um, make a better change and, and actually have effective policy reforms. And uh, thank you for that response. Is it, um, is it a fact that many, if not most, uh, police departments and municipalities would obtain insurance to cover uh, their uh, exposure uh, to any lawsuits uh, alleging violation of constitutional rights by uh, its police officers and other government officials? 
Yes, municipalities and police departments are able to receive insurance. Then you see um, insurance risk pools where multiple municipalities are covered by the same insurance policy. And then in the bigger cities, they make a determination whether they're going to have some amount of umbrella coverage insurance, some insurance, or be self-insured where they're making a city council decision to have reserves put aside. But that is not, um, that is not a determinant of how much in taxes that anyone is paying. All right, thank you. I'm about to run out of time, so I will yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Recognize Mr. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Owens, you're recognized. Uh, thank you. Uh, I won't take but a few minutes, and I'm going to give uh, my time back to uh, uh, my colleague. <clears throat> I, uh, I, I kind of entered this, uh, this, um, this debate really kind of trying to understand both sides. I'm not a lawyer. I have not been in this field. Uh, but I tell you, my gut feeling is that this is a continuation of the two-year-long defund the police. Um, right now, we have lower recruitment. We have lower ret uh, retention. We have higher crime. We have a demoralization of our police. And what we're going to do is add on to this more lawsuits. Um, I just have a gut feeling that this is not the way we should be going at this point. I think we've as a nation, recognizing that, that we cannot continue to uh, attack those who defend our, our, our freedoms and our rights. We're going to have bad players in everything we do. I would uh, rue the day that we have, we sue uh, parties because of what individual policymakers are doing. We look at the individual, if he's making, they're bad, bad players, and let's take, your, take, take advantage of that and, and go after them. But, uh, uh, this I have concerns about. I just, I just want to just ask real quickly, um, uh, Mr. Man Manguel, uh, is there any, any additional comments you want to add uh, to this, uh, this conversation uh, about this, um, I guess, the, the un 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 unintended consequences of what we're looking at with this type of uh, legislation? Absolutely. I mean, I won't reiterate the, the potential for unintended consequences with respect to uh, smaller municipalities' ability to, to find insurance coverage for this, but I, I do think it's worth um, just saying that uh, to the extent that the goal here is to reduce the risk of civil rights um, violations perpetrated by police officers overall, I do think it's important to have a more robust examination of police recruitment and retention trends. Um, in part because to the extent that what we're going to do is constrain um, the, the, the budgets of municipalities, big and small, where that's going to have an impact on their ability to attract high quality recruits to the profession. And if that happens, we're actually going to ironically raise the risk of constitutional harms being committed by police officers. Now, I also think it's really important to just recognize how rare police use of force is. I mean, there, I think the tone of this debate reflects an overestimation of uh, the rate of police use of force. In fact, police use force um, almost never. Uh, so there's one study um, in, done in 2018 of, of over 1 million calls for service to three uh, municipal police departments in three different states, one in North Carolina, one in Arizona, and one in Louisiana. Out of those million calls for service, 114,000 criminal arrests were affected. And that entire data set, only one fatal police shooting was captured. And in more than 99% of all of those arrests, no physical force was used. And in 98% of the cases in which force was used, uh, either no or mild uh, injury was sustained by the subject as uh, uh, according to um, medical professional review. So I, I think we have to take a step back, understand that we have almost 700,000 police officers making more than 10 million arrests a year. Um, and you know, the, the, the rate at which they make mistakes is certainly a problem worthy of public consideration, but it is not a problem as large as has, has been implied. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to yield back during my time, my colleague, thank you, member. Thank you, Mr. Owens. He yielded to me, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I think we had a minute left. I'll, I'll speak quickly. Um, I appreciate my colleague yielding. Um, for context, I think the, the Democrats call to defund the police, as I noted, is important. And I had three pages. If I had time, I'd read into the comment, into the record, uh, comments from our chairman, Jerry Nadler, Representative Karen Bass, Jamal Bowman, um, Corey Bush, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Mondaire Jones. Hakeem Jeffries, Pramila Jayapal, Ilan Omar, Ayanna Presley, Rashida Tlaib, among others who have said we need to defund the police. The question is for Mr. 
uh, Monkwell, if Democrats were successful in this mass defunding police department effort, would that help or hurt in fixing what they see as a problem with the Monell Doctrine and government employer liability for police actions? Well, I think it would hurt in, in the end, mostly because what you're going to end up with is a lower quality uh, police officer that's going to be more likely uh, to engage in official misconduct, either as a result of malice or as a result of ignorance. I mean, there's lots of research showing that a more educated police force is, is going to result in lower rates of force, lower rates of misconduct. Um, as we dissuade people from engaging in that profession and the ability of, of municipalities to, to use their budgets to attract people to that profession, we're going to um, worsen outcomes overall. Seems obvious to us. Thanks for your time. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Owens, you were the only person on this committee that wore cleats and a helmet pads. Other than Ms. Demings, I'm the only person that had a badge and a gun. And I am not for defunding the police. And the Democratic caucus is not for defunding the police. And because a few people in the Democratic caucus might have said something doesn't mean that 90% of the caucus and the caucus is for, we are for supporting the police. We put money in the bills that we passed, the relief bills, the rescue bill, to let local governments fund the police. And my city and my county put $28 million into funding the police. We recognize that need. I've supported the COPS program ever since I've been here. And it was a Democrat who sponsored that and passed the COPS bill. We need more community policing and more officers on the street to interact and to make good contact. This is not about anything anti-police. This is about justice. This is about when there are problems and when there are torts and when there are victims, that their justice is allowed, that the proper parties are allowed to be responsible for it, and that by being responsible, they will teach better and instruct the officers to follow the laws better and will have less problems in the future. This is about compensating the victims and also encouraging programs that will see to it that torts are not committed. So with that, I'd like to ask Ms. Ravindran a question. Despite the burdens and difficulties you describe in litigating claims under the law, body of law spawned by Monell. In your written testimony, you also emphasize the importance of preserving Monell because it is still an invaluable tool under certain factual circumstances. Can you explain further why Congress should allow plaintiffs to make respondeat superior claims in addition to the claims currently permitted under Monell? Thank you for your question, Chairman. Both Monell and respondeat superior are important for different types of claims. Monell can specifically target claims where a particular officer or governmental employee is not necessarily the reason that there was a violation. It's not an issue with that individual. It is an issue within the entire system. So the best example for that was something that I described in my written testimony, and that is a prison that has a building that creates a condition where it's overly hot, which creates an Eighth Amendment violation for the inmates inside. Now that's no particular officer's fault. No corrections officer has built the building. They are not in charge of the thermostat. They can't change that condition. In that kind of case, you need to be able to go after the municipality itself so that you can try to make a change there and get some compensation for anyone who may have been injured. Um, in, in terms of respondeat superior, that is important because in cases where there is a constitutional violation that can be tied to a particular officer or governmental employee's conduct, you should be able to go after that individual directly. But using respondeat superior, you can still make it the municipality's issue to deal with, to fix with training, with policies, with recruitment, and with termination of problematic officers. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Professor Blum. Clear from your testimony, you believe the Supreme Court and the Monell decision got it wrong regarding respondeat superior claims. If Congress were to amend the statute to permit those claims, would it be fair to characterize such legislation as correcting the court's error in an area of law that Congress has clear constitutional authority to legislate therein? Uh, yes, thank you for your question. And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, this was a, uh, the rejection of vicarious liability in Monell was an interpretation by the court of a statute. Uh, and Congress certainly has the power to tell the court, no, that's not what we meant, uh, or to correct the court's error in that sense. So uh, yes, uh, the answer is yes. Thank you very much. Um, 
With that, I'd just like to use my last minute to make clear what I'd said earlier. Police are for protecting the public and protecting the public with law enforcement, and, but proper law enforcement. Nobody's in favor of more George Floyds or more improper police shootings, but we're in favor of more better training, better understanding of different demographics in the community, and more involved police patrols with community policing. Police also, when I talked to a policeman when I was home and said, what should we do about guns? And he said, get those AR-15s out. I know those guns, they kill. They would kill us. In Uvalde, one AR-15 held off 19 good guys with guns. We need to protect the police and get rid of AR-15s. Ms. Garcia, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being a little tardy, but I had a markup at another he hearing. And I, too, just want to say, say for the record that, with all due respect to the ranking member, he read some names. And you may have noticed that it wasn't over 20, maybe 15. Our caucus is about a little over 200. He did not read 200 names because, in fact, as the chairman said, that is not the position of the Democratic caucus, and it is not the position of the Democratic Party. I um, don't want to get too involved with partisan politics, but when somebody makes that kind of comment, we do have to correct it for the record. Would the gentlelady yield? No, I will not. I have only have uh, five right. minutes, and they're my time. So I want to thank the chairman for convening this very necessary hearing. Uh, today's hearing explores the contours of state and local government employer liability under Section 1983. This hearing is essential as a matter of access to justice. Access to justice is a fundamental principle of the rule of law. As a judge and a lawyer, former judge and a lawyer, I very, very much understand that. Access to justice has many elements, one of which is having adequate remedies for grievances. Justice without a remedy is no justice at all. Access to justice also implies overcoming systematic barriers, financial, linguistic, cultural, and timeliness. In the absence of access to justice, people are deprived of having their voice heard, exercising their rights, protecting their constitutional rights, or holding their government institutions accountable. When people are deterred from exercising and protecting, protecting their constitutional rights, they're more likely to fall prey to the abuse of power by state and local government officials. Minorities, particularly Latinos, face many of these challenges. In my home state of Texas, we can find many of these examples of state-empowered abuses under the color of law. For example, Governor Abbott's so-called Operation Lone Star targets Latinos, individuals, for prosecution, thinking that they may have come across the border illegally. The state-sanctioned persecution of transgender children is another recent example. But somehow, my, my uh, colleagues across the aisle seem to be confused that this is about defunding the police. Again, no one is saying that. Uh, but I did want to ask uh, Professor Abdut, uh, when we talk about 1983 and we talk about police or other governmental employees, in fact, there are other governmental employees uh, that we, we, we are concerned about here. Could you just tell us, give us some examples of people other than police uh, that this would apply to? Of course, uh, governments have many, many different sorts of employees who do lots of different things who can, um, you have uh, folks in sometimes school districts, you may have folks who work to distribute funds, for example, um, Medicaid funds, Medicare funds, Basically, every single government employee who executes the law, who does something to execute the law, is someone who is touched by 1983. And uh, the category of individuals that we're talking about when we say, if there is a systemic subversion of federal constitutional right, there should be some remedy that addresses that systemic subversion of federal rights from anti-discrimination claims all the way through uh, law enforcement claims. Right. And I wanted to ask, uh, Professor, is it Rappenthal? You, you were talking about insurance and self-insurance. You didn't mention bonds. A lot of cities 
uh, and I also was a, a city controller in Houston, which, which oversaw the finances of about a $2.3 billion budget, and often we had to uh, float bonds to cover some costs of that. You know, more and more cities are floating bonds to cover the judgments as a result of some of these actions. Do you see an increase in it further uh, dead burden on municipalities as a result of some of these cases? We have not seen an increase in the cases that we've been involved in, and yes, I've seen the use of bonds on occasion. Usually there is a budget decision that's made if a city chooses to be self-insured, meaning that they allocate their own resources. It isn't determined based on how many judgments there are. They already have that budget, and usually that budget covers torts of all kinds, not just civil rights violations. Just to, It's determined by the city how they want to set aside those amounts. But yes, bonds are being used frequently for judgments on well, after I, a trial. I, I know, and I saw an article, and I, and I will try to get it, Mr. Chairman, and provide for the record. Uh, and this whole, I think it was coming out of a California case, that they're actually now characterized as police brutality bonds, because it is the high judgments, because these are the cases, really, that, that are the, the highest liability for, for some cities, that they're calling them police brutality bonds because... Um, without the bonds, uh, the cities will not be able to make and pay those judgments. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. I'll try to find the article and get it to us. Thank you very much. That concludes today's hearing. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today. Without objection, all members of five legislative days to submit additional written questions or additional materials. With that, we're done. <laughs>